Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Tally Ho. I got my coffee ready, so we're gonna tackle chapter 4 in this episode. But before we do, I wanted to say one thing. Uh, I know this is a vastly different uh, Let's Play from what I usually do, as are all of the choice of games and text games that I Let's Play from time to time, but I really appreciate anyone who's watching this. It's giving me a break from the usual uh, strategy bonanza, and for that I'm happy that uh, some of you are enjoying it with me. So thank you very much for joining me for something different and keeping your mind open, and I'm hoping that you will enjoy the entirety of this playthrough. If there's anything I can do to make it uh, more enjoyable for you, please let me know, because, you know, I'm doing it the best way I can, but if there's something that's irritating you or that you would suggest, I'm all ears. Anyway, chapter 4, A Hunting We Will Go. How lovely, says Frankincense. How wonderful to see you both. I have been looking forward to this day. I hope you haven't been having fun without me. Uh, oh well, says Rory, making fumbling movements with his hands. Not at all. Glad you're here and all that. I hear that we have some interesting guests to mingle with. An Inspector Ambrose, old Colonel Firesnuff, the strange haze woman, and dear Mopsy, naturally. Such a shame about her and Figs, don't you think? It's so sad when true love is thwarted. <laughs> Rory utters incoherently. I hear that one of the guests, uh, the esteemed professor of psychology, Clarence Q. Hickory, will not be attending. Isn't that sad? He is, of course, a very brilliant man. I think we could all stand some improvise. Uh, some Im wait. I think we could all stand some improving intellectual discourse. There's simply not enough of it these days. But he had some sort of incident down at the train station on the way here, and he has decided not to attend after all. Kransky Hickory, he had some accident down at the train station on the way here. Did we do anything with that? I wonder. Well, maybe we could have, but I'm not sure. Huh, I don't know. Maybe maybe that was an option, like we would trip over him, something like that. Anyway, she reaches out and smooths Cinnamon Bun's flank. Rory's horse immediately calms down and even nuzzles Frankie's sense a bit. What do I say? Rory whispers to you. <laughs> say something loving and sweet to her. Or say that you are looking forward to spending some time with her. Be genial. Or comment upon the weather, I murmur, knowing that Frankenstein must surely desire a word of affection from Rory. Uh, I think that, you know, say something, the, say that you are looking forward to spending some time with her. Uh, be genial. Some, sounds best. I don't think Rory is the type that would, you know, revel in... Uh, sweet stuff. What should I say? She knew how. All the words are flying out of my head, Rory whispers. Say, oh, Frankincense, nice to see you. That is all you need to say. Ah, Frankincense, nice to see you, Rory says. Frankincense look at Rory with an air of perplexity. Nice to see me? Rather. <laughs> well, all right. I feel as if I deserve a bit more of a greeting than one gives the milkman, but I suppose we must warm up to each other. But I think you are teasing me. Of course, of course I am, Rory says. I knew it. I don't know how, uh, that I care much for it, but here we are. There is an awkward silence. Rory calls nervously. You know, Rory, I didn't want to be quite so blunt, but I expected nothing less than a kiss. You know that is permitted. We are engaged. Are we? I mean, I know we are. It's just that, uh, rather that is to say, in public, sir, it would be most shocking, I say. Or... You have a bit of a cold and sore throat and don't wish to infect her, I murmur, knowing that this may irritate Frankincense. Or, we should get along with the hunt, I think. There will be time for pleasantries later. Or, oh, go ahead, sir, I whisper, knowing this may help to unite the two of them. Or, you wish to prolong the delights of vended bliss until the time is ripe, you say softly, thinking that you may be able to put Frankincense off with a pretty lie. No, I think, you know, go ahead, sir. I, I wish them well. I don't have any... Uh, and she, By the way, from just from this introduction, she seems amazing. She She's such a nice lady. So let's go uh, and say, oh, go ahead, sir, I whisper. Rory doesn't move. <laughs> if you love her, let her know that. Kiss her. Yes, I know, I know, says Rory. And he hides... He rides up to Frankie's sons, who wins over to accept Rory's kiss. You nod encouraging with Rory, who uncertainly plants a soft kiss on Frankie's lips. 
You make me laugh, so Frankison says. You mustn't be afraid of me. I am flesh and blood like you. Soon we will be wed, and we shall be happy forevermore. And how we will laugh at the day when you were uncertain whether a kiss would be appropriate. Yes, we shall laugh, Rory says. But Rory doesn't look much like laughing. Instead, he looks deeply confused. My God, like this is this is such such a irrita- irritation for me. I mean, he has this woman basically jumping into his lap, and he is all shy. Uh, the peacock shrieks as if to comment on this emotionally fraught moment. Frankenstein turns from Rory and then gives you a dazzling smile. Oh, Calvin, it has been far too long since you worked for us, but not a day goes by that I don't say, oh, how smooth Calvin made life for us. Frankenstein sighs. The estate is positively empty without you. I do miss those special drinks you used to mix, and the way you would polish the silver just so. It's hard to find someone with your sense of detail. We've hired and fired what seems like a dozens and dozens since you left. I do wish you hadn't. As Frankenstein's talk, your mind wanders back to the day you left the service of Signet Signet household. Why did you have to leave their service? The butler, correctly, believed that I was stealing. Oh, that then... <laughs> And it goes back to the, I'm a liar and a thief. I wanted to live in the city, not the country, and I regretfully tendered my resignation. Or I found Frankie's sense too irritating to live with, or my natural wanderlust that provoked me to leave. Wow, none of these options seem... We're definitely not going to be stealing. Um, living in the city, not the country, sounds like an interesting thing that's probably... Uh, definitely not the number three and uh, my natural let's go if i wanted to live in the city the city at senior estate is peaceful and lovely but you long for something bigger the museums the lending libraries and the intellectual stimulation of the city rather than the pretty but monotonous life of the country you enjoyed your time in the Signet Signet, but you made the right decision frankison's words shake you out of your reverie Come, Rory, let us be off. We must catch up with the others. I particularly want to talk to your Aunt Primrose about this hunt. She promised me that it would be a new style hunt where no animals are harmed or frightened at all. Yes, yes, we'll catch a fox and put him in a box and then we'll let him go, Rory quips. You laugh, but it is not right. No animal will be put in a box at all. She points on the penned peacocks. To capture a creature of nature like this makes me very angry. I have some very serious discussions to hold with your aunt, and will change her mind. I also brought my own dinner in protest of the dinner she has planned. Okay, well now now I don't like her all that much, because she's probably going to be a little bit of an activist, but on the other hand, she still sounds very lovely. Frankincense has become a vegetarian, Rory explains. She does not eat beef. I do not meat eat at all. I do not eat meat at all. But surely you eat fish, Rory says. Fish is meat. Frankison says with fire, as Rory looks quizzical. You look at Frankison, who looks a touch annoyed. I too do not partake of meat, I say. I would vote for fish being meat as well, or I don't know how you are able to resist a lovely rare steak. Wherever do you get your energy from? Uh, I'm not that much of a favor of vegetarianism, though I like uh, vegetarian food. Uh, I try to eat a meat um, you know, not every day, but uh, I wouldn't be able to live without me, especially because of the gym, and it's becoming a nightmare of, you know, stuff. So, for instance, for this one, let's go with the second one. They are more like vegetables of the sea, <laughs> or says. That's how I always think of it. But have it your own way. Thank you, Colin, Frankison says. Did that? Oh, it did. It did it. Uh, on Primrose, Chef does enjoy steak and a koa win and so forth. I hope you will be well provided during your stay here, you say. I hope so too. I provided the chef with a detailed list of, in, list of instructions and some choice ingredients to make his job a bit easier in accommodating me, Frankison says. I just don't quite understand why you won't eat fish though. That's the part I don't quite follow, Rory says. It's true that many vegetarians actually eat fish, though. Those are, what are they called? Prescoparians? Prescoparians? I'm not really familiar with that. Uh, but yeah, there, there is a special category for that. We have had this conversation several times already, and it is most tiresome. I'm a friend to swimming things, flying things, and crawling things. There is no animal for whom I do not feel admiration. 
Rory here seems to feel I take my conviction too far. You knew me when I was just beginning to get involved in local politics. You know the strength of my convictions. Tell him, Calvin, of the strength of my convictions, Frank is senses. I say you take these things just a bit too far, Rory says. When we are wed, there will be no meat in my house, Frankison says. Oh, God. We will have a healthy, ethical household without poisons like alcohol or tobacco. They are no good for you, Rory. You are too precious to me. For me as well, Rory says. You know the strength of my convictions. I do. Well, now we're starting to see who's going to wear the pants in this relationship. <laughs> then let us ride. We have so much to talk about. We have so many plans to make for our wedding. Not the least of all pinning down a date. I have a number of ideas for a honeymoon as well. What do you think of Venice? So romantic. Let us ride and talk. Rory looks to you face washed. Come with us, he whispers. Please, I don't know what came over me, but I need you to come along. Seamus, on primrose, cant cantankerous and dyspe dyspeptic groom. Jesus, those words. Lead out several white horses for you to consider. Which of these do you want? First... I've got Basket. Basket is fairly gentle, lovely curly mane and tail. Good if you don't much know what you're doing. But between you and me, she doesn't much know what she is doing either. A bit of a dunce, that one. And then I've got Sassy Sunshine. Sa oh, Sassy Sunshine. Sassy Sunshine is a headstrong charger, snorts fire. Good if you can take control of a wild thing of nature. Then you've got Old Dun Hissing Bottom. Old Dun Hissing Bottom is as mean as they come. And you've got to give as good as you get with him. Those are the only choices? Yep. Well, then I'll take... <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting. Bold. Uh, very bold. Embrace him. Wow. I mean... Sassy Sunshine is a headstrong charger, not fire. Okay, we're not gonna take the mean horse. Let's take Basket then. I mean, Basket is very gentle. Okay, sure. A fine choice, I'm sure. They say that one's choice of horse is something about one's personality. That's what I hear. What are you suggesting? Oh, I wouldn't care to speculate. Basket sure is a silly horse though, aren't you, Basket? Basket frisks up and down, reminding you almost of a rabbit. You notice that Basket has a very long, curly eyelashes. She looks at you quizzically. Good Basket, you say. Seamus holds out a carrot to her. She reaches her head down and eats a stick, then gags and spits it out in disgust. She doesn't see too well either. Oh, God. <laughs> at least I don't think she can, but she's alright. Good, good, <laughs> you say uncertainly. I think you picked the sweetest horse in the universe, says Frankie Sons. You are a good girl, Basket, aren't you? Basket tries to eat the same stick again. Oh, God. What have I done? I should have taken the Sassy Sunshine. At that moment, Valentine, your trainee, bounces around the corner of the house. Say, Calvin, I'm going to start getting the post-hunt snacks together. I've broken some of the delicate stemware. Isn't that the most... I'm a terrible butterfinger sometimes, but it's pretty fun so far. I think I'm doing well. But Carrington says that he's this close to throwing me down a well. Would you come and lend a hand? Post-hunt snacks? Yes, Mrs. Patterson has given instructions that we must set out an elegant table with white music. She was most specific. She then said that there would be hell to pay if everything wasn't perfect. I said that I didn't have a tremendous amount of experience at such things, but that I'd ask you. And then she said I could ask whomever I liked, as long as the work gets done. She was rather curt about it. Hmm, what should you say? Well, this is a way how we can stay behind and search uh, the house. I promise Regina that I would return to the house and I will keep that promise. Valentine needs uh, to fend for herself for a while. Uh, although I promised Regina that I would search the house, I will go on the hunt. Or although I promised Regina that I would search the house, Valentine needs my help. Snap. Okay, so it's not like this is our way out. This is basically a choice between one f between going with Rory, uh, going with Valentine, and going with Regina. I think that we're gonna go with Regina. 
From the top to bottom on the list of priorities, uh, keeping our master safe is the most important one. So let's go with the last one. No, wait, the first one. Yeah, we need to go with the house. Yeah. Although Rora and Valentine looks at you with pleading eyes, you made a promise. I'm sorry, sir, but I have responsibility to take care of back at the house. I will try to join you if I am finished in time. Oh, I understand, of course, Rora says distractedly. Come, come seek me out if you have the opportunity. And together, he and Frankincense ride off. That would be fine. <laughs> Valentine, just use your best judgment for now. But you'll come help me when you are able. Perhaps, you say, and a glimmer of hope comes over Valentine's face. I appreciate it. I really do, Valentine says. You say goodbye and then walk back to the house. My priority is searching the rooms, then helping Valentine, and then Rory. Yeah, I think it hurt our relations with him. But I think that help, that's going to help them to get together a, a bit. At least if he's not a complete dunce. You return to the foyer, much quieter now than when the hunting party left. Most of the servants are preparing dinner or preparing the dining room for the feast tonight. All right, Dandelion, Regina says. We have our work cut out for us. The house must be searched for evidence of nefarious spies, saboteurs, and double agents. Trust no one. There are eyes everywhere. I'm ready. How should we proceed? I have a lead I need to follow up on in town, she says. You will search wherever you think appropriate in the house. Here, she hands you an ornate key. This is a skeleton key that will open all of the bedrooms. Use your time wisely and be outside to greet the hunting party when they return. I will do my best. You will have to find the right path between being thorough, being quick and being careful. And at all times, our enemies will attempt to expose your deeds. This all sounds very dangerous, you remark. Indeed it is. That is the business we are in. Are you mentally prepared for the perils that will beset you? I laugh in the face of danger. I will do my best to affect satisfaction. And we'll see about that. Probably not. I don't think laughing in the face of danger is what we want to say. But uh, we're going to go with I will do my best to affect satisfaction. Uh, that didn't change anything, but fine. I appreciate your cool demeanor. It speaks well of your potential fit for the inner circle. I will be evaluating you, however, on your success and favor, not merely your attitude. Of course, you say. Now go forth and do us proud. After the fox hunt is concluded, we shall find a time to put together our hard-won information. Good, good luck, Dandelion. She walks briskly out of the house, leaving you to your investigation. The hunt has just begun and will conclude in about 2 hours and 30 minutes. Why should you go? Okay, so we got on Primrose's room, Colonel Farsnuff's room, Frankison's guest room, Hayes's guest room, Inspector Ambrose's guest room, Mopsy's room, Regina's quarters, and Valentine's quarters. Okay. So, someone means us harm. Obviously, it's not going to be on Primrose. That is idiotic. Obviously, it's not Mopsy, because Mopsy is, you know, barely able to function as a human being outside of her own love affair. Uh, Valentine is a suspect. I think that might be a logical thing. Colonel Firesnife is on my list, but that is an obvious choice. So Hayes, Inspector Ambrose, Regina, and Valentine. Actually, Regina, Regina might be like a like a double double card, double wild card, and it's gonna tell us something about her. That's that's the important part. So, so let's take it from from the most important one. I let's start with Hayes. Um, We'll see how long it takes. Hayes is staying in the ashroom, a guest room notable for its Napoleonic theme. Banners with golden eagle finials decorate the walls, and a marble bust of Napoleon adorns the broad stone fireplace mantle. Four golden cherubim wearing laurel wreaths and short tunics serve as the posts of the canopy bed. They brilliant, uh, their brilliant gold is reflected an infinite number of times by the wall-sized gilt-edged mirrors 
hanging on the left and the right walls as you enter. You scan the room. A single traveling trunk sits at the front of the bed, and a pack of various tarot cards lies on the nightstand. You notice a bit of paper, not quite burned in a fireplace grate. It seems to be a fragment of a map of Ritornello and the house next to it, including the rooms and grounds. A path leading from a window to a door to another window seems to be marked on it, but in the absence of more context, it is impossible to be certain what you are looking at. Take the bit of paper. One never knows when that sort of thing will come in handy. You then turn your attention to the traveling trunk. Uh, the trunk is clasped, but not locked and you open it carefully. In addition to the clothing and assorted toiletries that one would expect, you find a small silver box decorated with an engraved autumn leaves. The hinges look like trees with just a few leaves left on them. The small silver box is locked. Forcing the top open will break it. I think we should try to pick the lock. The walk is quite simple, and you spring it with just judicious application of a sharp pencil. Then, satisfied with your success, you open the box. You could not say with any precision what small clues there were that made you drop the box and dive away. Perhaps this was intuition. Perhaps a guardian angel came to your aid. Perhaps it was your keen senses. It is difficult to say. Whatever it was, however, caused you to dive aside as a pack of bright green dye explodes within the box, splattering the dye on the wall and floor across from the trunk, but, and this is crucial, not splattering you. Inside you find some money, rolled into a tight cylinder, and a black mask designed to cover much of the face. It looks well-worn, soft and flexible, very much the sort of thing one would wear if one were up to no good. Interesting. You replace the mask and consider a crucial question. How much of the money do you take? I take all of it. I help myself to a few I leave it where it is. You aren't here to take his money. You do, however, wonder why she thought it necessary to protect her money in such an extravaga extravagant fashion. You look around for the die. You look around at the die bespatted room in dismay. You suppose your business here is concluded, and so you depart Hayes' room as swiftly as possible. The hunt will conclude in about 2 hours and 20 minutes. Where should you go? Okay, so. Um, next is Valentine on my list of suspects, so let's go to Valentine's room. You head to the sun to the sub-basement where the newest members of Aunt Primrose's help are quartered. You find Valentine's room, which she is sharing with another new hire. The room is only slightly larger than a sizable broom closet, but just big enough for two narrow beds with thin mattresses, a few shelves, and a shared nightstand. Valentine's positions are jumbled all over the bed, her clothes in a huge untidy heap. On one shelf is a quick note that Valentine seems to have jotted down as a reminder for herself. It reads, Advice from Calvin. Most important is not to be so bound by what I'm told. I have to be free to add with. I have to see the problem before it becomes a problem and solve it. I have to be constantly working to improve myself. Remember, three exclamation marks, I want to be at the top of my chosen profession, and the only way I can do that is to listen carefully to Calvin. Don't be intimidated and don't worry. I can do this, three exclamation marks. You turn from the note to consider the very large heap of clothes and sundries on the bed. I can bear it. I fold Valentine's clothes. It will take a while, and I suppose it will betray my presence here, but perhaps I will find something interesting as I tidy up. Or I look through Valentine's positions to see if there's anything immediately interesting. Or nothing here looks worth spending time on, and I depart. Mm. <sighs> well... Folding her clothes. I think that's a that's not a good way to go. Let's just quickly look through them. You pick up a handful of Valentine's clothes and shake them to see if clues falls out. And then you scout about the small room, eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. After looking around for ten minutes, you find a small packet stuffed into the pocket of an old jacket. Uh, it is a typed document which you unfold carefully. It reads, Dear Valentine, I think it is a wise idea to find your way to a place like Primrose Patterson's, but don't you think you'll stick out? 
You have many wonderful qualities, but subtle play acting is not one of them. They will be on to you in no time, my dear. But as always, you do as you wish. And I agree with you that there is a great deal of value that you can take from Ritornello, if you think you can get away with it. And to be perfectly honest, if you were able to bring here some money, that would be very helpful. But please do not get yourself arrested. Much love, your very concerned sister. Oh snap. You read the letter again and then replace it. This seems like an important coup. Mindfilled with various Valentine-centric scenarios, you shake your head as you depart her room. The hunt will conclude in about 2 hours and 10 minutes. I think we're good on time. Hey, you're not supposed to be in here, someone says behind you. What were you doing? Coming out of a room across the hall is young Walter, one of Aunt Primrose's footmen. He's straightening his jacket and giving you a suspicious look. We've been told to keep a weather eye out for suspicious behavior. I've got a mind to march over to Mrs. Patterson and Inspector Ambrose and let them know just what's going on here. You know Walter. Walter is well known for accepting money for favors around the house and has been known to put the squeeze on guests when something unsavory is going on. You would guess a suitable bribe would keep him quiet, but perhaps there is another way. Laugh with Walter, saying that you are merely pitching in to tidy up around the house. Listen carefully. I became aware that Walter is not behaving appropriate himself and threaten stern countermeasures were he to inform upon me. Offer Walter a substantial monetary incentive to say nothing. Minus 10 money. Um... You know what? What is one known for accepting money? Put a squeeze on guests when something unsavory is going on. Let's offer him money. Oh, I don't think you say, saw anything you say. I feel certain of it. You still bought a substantial donation of the readies, painful though it is. And he pockets up his ill-gained goods in a fright. He taps the side of his nose in a conspiratory gesture. You and me, we understand each other, he says. People of the world. Fellow travelers on a ship of life. We know what makes the world go round. And, hands in his pocket, he whistles and strolls away, leaving you unreported upon, but somewhat the poor. The hunt will conclude in about two hours and ten minutes. Where should you go next? Okay, so... Uh, Regina's quarters. I know this is a bit, bit of a maybe weird thing to do, but uh, I need to double check that she's, you know, not though she's not trying to uh, point it on someone else rather than her. You head downstairs and across the long spare corridor that leads to the housekeeper's bedroom. Regina warned you that all might not be as it seems, and perhaps it would be in the spirit of thoroughness to give her room a once over. The solid wood door, however, is locked and the master key she gave you does not open it. I pick the lock using a straight pin. I give the door the old heave-ho, although it is inelegant, the approach has a certain direct quality, although the door does look quite solid. The wood grain towards the top of the door looks slightly irregular. I look at it carefully. I suppose I'd better go elsewhere. Uh, let's look at the wood grain towards the top of the door. Why, there's a subtle sliding panel there on the door, very much in the spirit of the best spy uh, serial stories. You slide the panel and the reward is a distinct click and the door unlocks. Actually, this is kind of interesting. I wonder if this came from our observation and intellect or whether this is always option uh, for you. It is with no small amount of satisfaction that you open the door and take in its contents. Regina's quarters are spare. Although the housekeeper is among the highest status servants in the household, her accommodations are cramped and incredibly spartan. Although the small window lets in some dappled golden sunlight, filtered through the yellow oaks outside. All that you see in here are a narrow wardrobe and undecorated wooden handstand with a few black hats on it, and a sharply made bed with plain dark grey sheets with a bright blue envelope sitting on the pillow. In bold lettering it reads, Top Secret Information. <laughs> oh, oh. That's a trap! Uh, I searched the room far away before examining the envelope. Our search meticulously without... Let's search meticulously without leaving a trace. Takes 20 minutes. You had the feeling 
that it would not do to have Regina know uh, that you have been going through her room. And so you are extra careful to avoid leaving any traces of your passing as you search. As you search the room, you cannot help noticing a nearly invisible thread connecting the bright blue envelope to the light fixture behind the bed. Looking closely, you can see that the thread passes through a crack in the wall. If the thread were pulled, you suspect the panel in the wall may open. What that would entail, you cannot say. I grab the envelope and then duck under the bed. I have come to the conclusion that I, sh that I should probably leave at this point. Leave well enough alone, as it were, or I delicately pry open the wall panel. Now this is obviously a trap, like, she's not an idiot. If she leaves that, that's a, that's a trap for someone that breaks into her room. So, uh, let's leave. Let, let's leave. That, that's a trap for someone else. You don't think you would like to press the point further. You came in here and looked around. Taking the envelope would just be gilding the lily as far as you are concerned. Like, who leaves an envelope saying top secret information? That's that's idiotic. So that, that's a, obviously a trap. Therefore, you depart in short order and return to your investigation. The hunt will conclude in about 1 hour and 50 minutes. Mm. Okay, Colonel Farsnuff's guest room. You open the door to the spruce room, the guest room that Colonel Farsnuff is using. It is a room decorated in rich dark wood with animal heads on plaques on nearly every inch of a wall. On Primrose's late husband, Mr. Patterson, was a keen hunter, and this room contains his trophies. It is a fitting room, then, for Colonel Farsnuff. Notably, a very large stuffed moose with a highly annoyed expression occupies one corner, looking at you as if it wants to say something offensive to you. You take a quick look around and notice some notes Colonel Farstaff has written to himself on a pad relating to the upcoming boat race. The notes mention one Jabs McNabb, who will be rowing for Colonel Farstaff's team in the upcoming Harvest Festival boat race. This Jabs person will be on the lookout for any opportunity to defeat on Primrose's team during the race, and appears to be angling to lure boats into a hidden ambush. No amount of dishonesty seems to be off the table for Jabs McNabb, clearly a dirty trickster of the first water. This is very shocking and tells you a good deal about Colonel Farsnuff. You put down the notes and continue to look around. A briefcase sits on the mahogany dresser, a shaving kit and a book rest on the night table. The briefcase is battered but sturdy, and a quick glance around the room tells you that the briefcase is the important clue here. It calls to you as if taunting you with the secrets that surely must lie inside. You give it a tentative shake. It sounds like there are a few papers inside. Annoyingly, the briefcase is walked. I try to pick the walk. It takes 10 minutes. Or I try to break it or I leave it. Let's try to pick the walk. First, you have to locate the paper clip, then bend it into a suitable walk pick and go to the work on the walk. After fiddling with it for 10 minutes, it becomes clear to you that you are not going to be able to spring the walk and you give up. Now what? Um, I leave it alone. I'm not going to break it that... Yeah, perhaps it would be best to simply move on. You don't really need to find out what extremely interesting and informative materials lies therein, you tell yourself. Um... Uh, as you start to leave Colonel's fast enough room, you hear a heavy thread in the hallway and a low and a low and a melodious humming. You duck back into the Colonel's room until whoever it is passes. Bum 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 hums Colonel Farsnuff just, just outside the door, fumbling with his keys. I hide behind the stuffed moose, I dive under the, the bed, I lean against the wall nonchalantly and greet the Colonel in a casual manner. Holy hell, wasn't he supposed to be on the... <sighs> on the... Um, on the hunt? Well, if we dive under the bed, we're basically... Oh, I forgot where the moose was. Uh, was it near the door? Because if we hide behind it, then we can sneak out while he is not paying attention. But if we dive under the bed... We are stuck there. So let's hide behind the stuffed moose. Uh, 
Uh, you stand for a moment in the middle of Colonel Farsnuff's room before realizing that the stuffed moose is the best hiding spot, and so you slip behind it, trying to ensure that your legs are relatively concealed behind the moose's legs. Already feeling uncomfortable, you hear Colonel Farsnuff open the door and sigh heavily. Now, why on earth was my room unlocked? That was rather careless of me. Forgetting things, I suppose. You hear some shuffling. Can't believe I forgot my lucky hunting boots. Now, let's see. Ah, there they are. He sits down on the foot of a bed, removes his shoes, and then tugs on his boots. Then he wanders over to the moose. I've never noticed what a prize this is. So lifelike, he says, stroking the moose. Perhaps I'll examine it from all angles to more fully appreciate it. <sighs> Colonel Farsnuff walks slowly around the right flank and then to the back of the moose as you attempt to match his footsteps and keep the bulk of the moose between you and him. Unfortunately, a squeaky floorboard alerts the colonel who pauses in his appreciation of the moose. I say, come out of there. Is there someone behind the moose? He looks around the side of the moose, but you move too, keeping the moose between you. Of all the confounded... Come out, I say. One can't use a moose to hide forever, you know. You continue circling around the moose, not quite concerned. Oh, a sneaky one, are you? Well, try this one for a size. Colonel Farsnuff suddenly dives under the moose, and you are forced to leap atop it. You attempt to get some purchase for your leap via the antlers, but instead of graceful leap, the whole moose comes crashing down in a cloud of dust and stuffing atop the colonel. You take the opportunity to escape the room and hide in a hallway closet until Colonel Farsnuff emerges, hopping mad, shouting that he intends to get to the bottom of the moose-related pranks. Finally, ten minutes later, it appears safe to emerge, although you are certain that Colonel Farsnuff will not long keep the news of a suspicious person in the house to himself. The hunt will conclude in about an hour and forty minutes. Damn it. Okay. So we have an hour and forty minutes. So I think this will give us time enough to check all of the rooms. Just... I mean, what the hell? Let's let's go with Inspector next. He's the least likely person, but according to Regina, Inspector Ambrose is staying in the Pine Room. Since Inspector Ambrose was a late addition to the party, he was given the smallest room. Really, it used to be a storage closet, but it has since been renovated and transformed into a cozy nook of a guest room for guests traveling alone who don't mind not having much space. You unlock the door of the Pine Room and step in, closing the door behind you. A display stand holding a black clay pipe sits on a tiny writing desk, and a copy of a Wilkie Collins novel, The Moonstone, rests on top of a stack of other novels. You notice that the novel is sitting on top of a slender notebook, and you extract it and skim through it. The notebook contains a dossier on, the, on one Regina Wilhelmina, who Inspector Ambrose believes to be a member of a shadowy organization of a villainy. The notebook has a detailed record of her comings and goings, and ends with Inspector Ambrose's stated intention to unmask her illegal activities and bring her to justice. He further believes that the Cadbury Club, based in London, but with satellite branches elsewhere in Britain, is a hotbed for nefarious activity. A shocking belief, but understandable. After all, the Cadbury Club is highly exclusive and rather secretive. Naturally, Inspector Ambrose, not being in service, would wonder what your club is all about, but he has completely misunderstood the noble goals of the August Society. You replace the notebook carefully under the novel. The most notable occupant of the room is a huge piece of white poster board leaning against the wall, simply covered in drawings, pieces of papers and newspaper clippings, all attached with pushpins. Six different colors of yarn connected the pictures and articles. You step in front of the poster board and consider it carefully. It is a study of either genius or madden. It is a study in either genius or madness, possibly both. At the center of the chart is an outline of a face with a question mark in the center of it, labeled "White Fingered Blue Master Thief." I wonder if that's Hayes, because she had that mask and money. And well, White Fingered Blue Master Thief. A hand-drawn picture of everyone staying at Ritornello appears on the board as well, with various pieces of evidence possibly connecting them to the criminal mastermind. Pieces of yarn connect the sketches to pieces of evidence, like ticket stubs, an orange peel, and a jigsaw piece puzzle. You cannot help noticing that most of the pieces of red yarn lead to the really unflattering sketch of you. 
Your image is also connected with Yarn to index card that says criminal tendencies and not to be trusted. This is rather disturbing. What should you do about it? It would be safest to just leave it alone, but maybe if you are clever enough to figure out what his system is, you can rearrange it to suit you. You could even re rearrange it to implicate someone else together. I shouldn't touch it. Ambrose's investigation will no doubt clear the innocent and condemn the guilty in the end. I rearrange the, ra the yarn so that I am not the center of Inspector Ambrose's suspicion. It takes 20 minutes. I rearrange the yarn that it implicates someone else. Looking at the charge, I might be able to arrange it that it implicates Valentine, Fix, or Hayes. No, we're not. We're not gonna do that. Let's uh, let's just leave. You stay, stay, step away from the poster board and resolute. Uh, wait, you step away from the poster board and resolutely determine not to interfere with this admittedly strange investigation in progress. Instead, exiting the room and heading elsewhere altogether. The hunt will conclude in about 1 hour and 30 minutes. Yeah, we got enough time, so let's go with Mopsy. You open the door of the room Mopsy has been staying in during her several months long stay at Return Neville. Or rather, you try to open the door. You are only able to get the door open a third of the way before it becomes jammed by a solid pile of laundry thrown on the floor. Indeed, the whole of Mopsy's room seems to have taken a brunt of Mopsy's frustration at being kept apart from fakes. The maids have obviously given up all hope of tidying the place. Dirty clothes, used dishes, crumpled papers, and dainty handkerchiefs moist from weeping, wait on the floor up to nearly ankle depth in places. The room once had a carousel horses theme, but the, the decorative lamps and statuary have been removed from the shelves and night tables and dumped in a heap in a corner. The notion of doing even a cursory search of this place seems practically impossible, but on the other hand, maybe anything important will be on the topmost strata of detritus. Luckily, there is no danger of leaving any trace of you having been here. You pace around the room, noticing a few tidbits of interest, such as Mopsy's diary lying open against the wall. The page is the page it is open to contains a sketch of you drawn in bright colored pencils. At the top of the page it says Calvin is coming to visit uh, exclamation mark also Rory. But the most intriguing thing in Mopsy's room is her writing desk. Her desk and the waste paper baskets and the floor nearby are overflowing with crumpled pieces of pale pink stationery. Mopsy has been hard at work to compose a letter and on her desk sits the finished product. The cream covered envelope is addressed to Aunt Primrose. It is sealed but not well, and it is simple for you to slide the thrice folded letter out of the envelope. It reads as follows. Dear Aunt Primrose, I have something to declare. You won't like it, so be aware. Can you hear my nightly cries from hearing all your dirty lies? How can you treat me the way you do? You grind me underneath your shoe. I'm feeling like a raw cashew. I know you're hearing nothing new, and so I bid to you adieu. Sincerely, Mopsy. The eyes are all dotted with hearts. This is not a very good poem. I think I'll just improve it a touch and then reseal it. Takes 20 minutes. Perhaps I will simply put the water back in and reseal it. I have a brilliant idea. What if I just change Dear Aunt Primrose to Dear Figaro and then replace the poem in the envelope? That will surely persuade Aunt Primrose that Mopsy doesn't care for figs anymore. I had better destroy this poem and reseal it. Uh, reseal the envelope. That would be in Mopsy's best interest. Takes 10 minutes. I can help it. I have to clean this place up for Mopsy before I deal with this letter. Take 10 minutes. Now we're not cleaning and we're not uh, sending it to Dear Figaro. I think that destroying this poem and resealing the envelope is because. I mean, we want to help her, um, you know, getting her and fix together, but I don't want uh, her to. Hmm. No, on the other hand, let's not tamper with this. Perhaps I will simply put the letter back and reseal it. It is usually best not to meddle with people's mail. You replace the letter carefully, reseal the envelope, and exit Mopsy's room. Uh, wait a moment. As you head out of Mopsy's room, you notice that one of her floorboards seems a bit loose, just in front of the door. You kneel down and notice that the floorboard can be lifted away entirely, and inside is a small rolled-up black mask designed to cover the top half of the face. 
It looks like a hastily made costume piece for a highwayman costume. It looks rather like the mask you found in Hayes' room, you realize. Except that Mopsy's looks rather slapdash. The eye holes aren't perfectly even. You aren't quite sure what to make of the resemblance. This seems like a piece of evidence, although you aren't quite sure what it can mean. You replace the mask and, mulling this information over, close the door. Okay, we still have an hour and 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, I think this is definitely because of our high observe skill. Achievement, two masks. You found two masks while searching return level. Okay. Uh, now, let's go to Frankison's guest room. I, I don't suspect either her or on Primrose at all. The Myrtle Room, one of the final bedrooms at Ritornevo, is decorated in lavender with silver accent. A vase filled with violet asters sits on a piano near the windows. A zither on a satin cushion sits nearby, in case some Turing zither aficiano should happen by, no doubt. Frankincense, having arrived late, has had not much time to unpack. Her three va uh, valets are stacked in the... or valises? I'm not sure how to pronounce the plural here. Her three valises are stacked in the corner next to a strangely out of a place looking wooden crate labeled fragile. The crate emits an earthly smell, and when you lift the top, it, um, top of it, you see what appears to be a rotting log covered in all manner of white and light brown mushrooms. You don't know what you expected to find in here, but it wasn't that. A label on the inside of the crate lid reads, Grow your own gourmet quality mushrooms. Oh, well, so she's uh, she's she's experimenting with vegetarian food. You poke around the room some more, noting the short to-do list that Frankincense has left atop her diary, which sits on the writing desks. The to-do list is titled Ferrari and reads, Change gas to eating habits entirely. Smoking and consumption of intoxicating beverages stops at once. Attendance and lectures and public forums for mental stimulation. Ancient daily exercise. Bring improving literature into his life. Subscribe to daily newspaper for some sense of what's going on in the world. Like sense of budget, including unnecessary luxuries. Overhaul of wardrobe. I mean, this is a woman that will bring out the best of you. But if you find her, she's going to break you. <laughs> so, I don't know. I... I I would love a partner that, that has these intentions for me, but I hate that she's obviously going to push them whether he likes it or not. Uh, but yeah, she seems like a like a good person. The list has a doodle in the margin reading Frankincense Wintermint in an impressive calligraphic language. Yeah, she's, she's in love with him. She means well. The question, it seems to you, is whether you want to take a peek at Frankincense's diary or leave it untouched. I will leave her diary unread. It would be too great of a breach of trust. I will read a few entries of Frankenstein's diary, but only the parts about how she feels about Rory. Or I will read through Frankenstein's diary, looking not only for parts about Rory, but also for something that indicates how she feels about me. No, we're not doing this. Um, we're not doing that. We'll leave the diary. Mm, you know, we trust her. She means well. Obviously, she has she has plans for marriage. And this is, you know, Frankenstein's winterman. She, she, she wants to marry him. So let's leave that. Although you are in Frankenstein's room without permission, reading her diary seems somehow beyond pale, and you decide you cannot cross the line. As you turn away, sighing, you notice something. There in the corner, where the floor meets the wall, there is a small crack in the floor, and in the crack something is sparkling. You use the corner of a piece of paper to nudge it out of the crack. It's a jewel. In fact, it looks like a diamond. I put it in my pocket. I'm keeping it. I will take it so that I can return it to her later. Or I will leave it there. It doesn't concern me. Uh, there in the corner where the floor meets the wall. There is a small crack in the floor. And in that crack something. Oh, so she lost it. Okay, let's take it and return it to her later. Okay. Let's take it so we can return it to her later. You wrap it carefully in a handkerchief and stow it away for now, and then depart the room. The hunt will conclude in about one hour and 30 minutes. So, on Primrose's room is the last one.
Casting a cautious eye up and down the hallway, you furtively unlock Aunt Primrose's door, glide in, and close the door behind you. Aunt Primrose's boudoir is decorated in a manner befitting a woman who loves the outdoors. The room is papered in a green twi twining ivy motif and gilt etched paintings of jockeys and horses adorn the walls. Her grade 4 poster bed, each post topped with a horse head finial, dominates the room. You also note a large wardrobe, a full length standing mirror, a dressing table, and a closed roll top writing desk. From out the slightly open window, you can hear the sound of horns from the hunt. You do a quick sweep of the room, glancing behind the mirror, opening drawers, examining the desk, peering under the bed, and looking through the cosmetics and baubles on Aunt Primrose's dressing table. A good deal of papers written in Aunt Primrose's aggressive script relate to her thoughts about the upcoming boat race. You note in particular that she considers only Colonel Farsnuff to be a worthy competitor, discounting entirely the other two entrants, the police boat sponsored by the local police department, and a boat sponsored by the worshipful company of Cordwainers, who seems to be a group of very aged, long-bearded men who seems to come in at last every year. Soon you realize that, aside from an inordinate number of periodicals pertaining to sports, the most important piece of information here is a number of letters in very poor handwriting in the roll top desk. The letters appear to be signed Finksel, Fangble, or just possibly Fledmo, per perhaps. I don't have time to read them far away, but I give the documents a quick glance to get a sense of the topic. I read the documents carefully. I ignore the documents entirely in favor of sweeping the room for valuable jewelry I can pocket. We have an hour and 30 minutes. This is the last room, so let's uh, read the documents carefully. You study documents carefully, focusing on your considerable uh, intellectual talent upon the task of deciphering uh, the handwriting. As best as you can discern, it appears that Aunt Primrose has asked someone to keep a secret about her past. It seems that Aunt Primrose believes that someone has been prying into her history and has uncovered a troubling piece of information that could create scandal if made public. She even fears that the damage could be so great that she would be forced to sell Ritornello and move far away if the information was revealed. As you read on, you learn that Aunt Primrose's correspondence believes that Colonel Firesnuff is the person prying into her affairs and warns her to be on her guard lest she is blackmailed. Wait, what? One more time. Is he the... It seems that Aunt Primrose believes that someone has been prying into her history and has uncovered a troubling piece of information. Okay. As you read on, you learn that Aunt Primrose's correspondent believes that Colonel Firesnuff is the person. Ah, okay, so, yeah, he's, he's trying to blackmail her. You replace the documents. This is a very serious matter. Rory feels great affection towards the Tornello. It has been in the family for generations, and the notion of passing it to strangers is a troubling one. The information is still sinking in. You leave on Primrose's room. The hunt will conclude in about one hour and ten minutes. Where should you go? Well, uh, we're going to leave the house and see what Valentine is doing, and then we're going to catch the hunt. You find Valentine sitting against the side of the house near the herb garden, smoking. Hey, says Valentine when she sees you. Come for a smoke? I wanted to see what you were doing here. Done with your work? For now. You find a flat, clean rock near Valentine and sit down on it. Valentine flicks off the ash from the end of the cigarette and looks at you. Funny for your thoughts, Calvin. What do you want to talk to Valentine about? Do you know anything about spies, saboteurs, or other evildoers? I can help noticing that you have a fascinating accent. I thought I read a letter from your sister, but you said you had only six brothers. I'd like to hear some more about you, Valentine, or I noticed that Valentine wants to ask me something. Uh, well, let's see what she wants. What is it, Valentine? You can ask me something if you want. I... I just have a sort of awkward question to ask. It's kind of a racy question. I don't know if it's proper to ask. Think of me as of a friend, Valentine. 
You don't have to hold back. Ask me whatever you need to ask me. Or if it is an, an inappropriate question, perhaps it is better that you not ask it. Or I'm listening, but please maintain the quorum. No, think of me as a friend. Okay, that puts us up back on Friday. Oh, really? I didn't think you... Well, thank you. You didn't think I what? No, nothing. How are intimate relationships between the help and the residents or guests of a house thought of? I'm thinking of relationships that might cross class lines, Valentine asks. I know that, uh, that I know that's a humdinger of a question. Why do you ask that thoroughly explosive question? I'm just curious, she replies. Hmm. Well, we have four options here, and as far away forbidden, get that learned and learned well. Or, it happens. Emotions are emotions. It's alright to be tempted, but the impulse must be reined in. Or, are you mad? You've been here for less than one day. And you're an adult. Just be discreet. There are nooks behind the backstairs of most great houses, if you take my meaning. Hmm. I guess um, option one and option three especially are off the table. We're not going to call her mad. I'm not going to tell her it's far away forbidden. Um, but you're an adult, just be discreet. It's sort of encouraging it. So I'd say option two, it happens. Emotions are emotions. It's all right to be tempted, but the impulse must be reined in. Seems like an option I'd take. I know how to do that. Don't worry. I really just wanted to know what the boundaries are. Sure, but the rules were the same in other places you worked, you reply. I never worked with so many people before. I didn't know if there was more leeway. What do you want to talk to Valentine about? Also, we're getting options to uh, to open all of these. Mm, okay, that actually... Oh, did it? I thought we had 33. Uh, maybe... Oh, who knows? Uh, I'd like to hear some more about you, Valentine. Valentine twirls the cigarette around her fingers for a moment. I grew up in a small time in the Cotswolds, where it was expected that I would work at my parents' sweet shop. With so many kids in the family, you can imagine that money was tight. Of course, you say. But after my parents both got sick, I had to provide for my family and I found my way to the city, taking on a few temporary short-term positions to learn the trade and then joined the Junior Cadbury Club where I was nominated as most promising. As you listen to Valentine, something troubles you. When you first met Valentine, she told you about herself, but as you recall, she told you the same story in exactly the same way. No detail was omitted and even the wording was almost exactly the same. That strikes you as rather odd. There's something far too practiced about this story. You narrow your eyes at Valentine and you can see her flinch just a tiny bit at your scrutiny. I just want to do them proud, is all. I have to earn enough to help them out. I think I can do it. It's just hard, you know. Of course, you reply. See, we have a little money put away. But when Pa got sick, some of us had to take in laundry when we could get it. And then Ma got sick and baby Tom. We don't know what it is. We just don't know. Valentine's eyes moisten and she wipes them with her sleeve. I've never been away from home for so long before. I just think about the smell of home cooking and my brothers getting up to their tricks. It's all so different here. Almost nobody is friendly or wants to just joke around. She crushes her cigarette butt on the food and then lights another. I guess this is my m moment of truth. As Valentine says that, a sunbeam strikes her and a chill wind blows past, tossing Valentine's already messy hair. Hmm. Uh, I can't help noticing that you have a fascinating accent. Valentine flushes. Oh, I know, she says. When I came to London, people teased me about my Gorchester. Ah, I forgot. <laughs> uh, Shire. It's um, it's different. I, I know that you guys mentioned it. I have to f Google that. <laughs> uh, let's go with Gorchester accent. I never really gave a thought to it at home, of course. But the ones who sound a bit fun... You're the one who sound a bit funny to me. Aha. Uh -huh. What town are you from? Stole on the wall. It's tiny. 
You've probably never heard of it. Sure I've heard of it. Really? Of course. They have big fire there, don't they? The horse fire, yes. This is nice, Calvin. It's almost like a little piece of home away from home, you knowing about it. Your accent really is interesting, though, you say, the thought dawning on you even as you say the words. What, what do you mean? I mean, it's a very good accent. It's very, very good. But it's not exactly right. What are you talking about? I doubt anyone who wasn't as traveled as I am would catch it, but I'm rather perceptive. There's something about the vowels that doesn't quite hit my ear right. Valentine laughs. Oh, I understand. My mother was American. She came over years ago, but she still talks different. I guess I talk a little like her. That would explain it. Oh, of course. Ha ha. Ha ha. Valentine looks positively terrified, so you pause and let her smoke a bit before you continue your conversation. Mm, suddenly, Valentine begins to cry. What do you do? Could you kindly stop crying? I move next to her and give her a hug, or I pat Valentine uncomfortably, saying, There, 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 there. Let's move next to her and give her a hug. I think that's gonna be the best option there. Oh, Calvin, Valentine cries. Oh, Calvin. Oh, wow, that actually gave us 19 points. You don't see anything. You just thought Valentine shudder sob against your chest. I'm horrible. I'm the worst. Shh, you say. I have you. I'm a terrible liar, Valentine says. Terrible. Tell me the truth, then. I'm American. I'm not from the Cotswolds at all. You have an astonishingly good fake accent. I know. I've had an accent coach. Why would you have an accent coach? I'm an actress. I worked on the stage for years, and I'm trying to break into the movies. An actress, you say? What kind of acting? Cabarets, mostly. Lately, I've been able to get some supporting roles in very good stuff, though. I was in a show play... And some Shakespeare. Well, based on Shakespeare, loosely. A showgirl? You, your head reels to think of how on Primrose would be horrified to learn that a showgirl were under her roof. I'm not a showgirl. I mean, I guess I am, but I won't be more for much longer. And why is that, you ask? Because I'm about to have my big break. I've got an audition coming up in Hollywood in a few weeks. It's the most swell part you ever saw. It's a romantic piece set in a bit of English country house like this one. I have to play the perfect servant. That's why I thought of this brilliant idea to come over here and learn the ropes. I earned my passage by singing and dancing on a cruise ship from New York, and I figured I can do the same heading back. But how do I come into it? I hung around the Cadbury Cup in London and overheard a juicy rumor that you were being considered for something called the Inner Circle. I don't even really know what that is. I just figured it meant you knew what you were talking about and I could learn from you. That's all. Then I forged the weather. So you weren't really hired by Mrs. Patterson? Nope. But Mrs. Patterson and Carrington thinks I work for your employer. That's what I told them anyhow. Carrington thought it was strange, but he didn't mind assigning work to me when I asked for it. I'm so sorry, Calvin. I lied to you. But I just really, really need to get this part. I wanted to be a star my whole life. Please don't tell on me. Just let me learn from you. Valentine sobs again. What do you do? I stand up and admonish Valentine, noting that I will have to inform the proper authorities. I can't be angry at Valentine. I promise to keep her secret. Or I will neither chastise Valentine nor promise anything. I have to think about this. Uh, let's go with I can be angry at Valentine. I think I think this is the truth. Um, it goes well with the letter she gave us, or no, the letter that we found, the fo the letter that we found in her, um, in her room. So I can be angry at her. I promise to keep her secret. Don't worry, Valentine. You say I know you didn't mean any harm. It was a bit foolish, but that's not a crime. You won't say anything. No, I won't. Calvin, you are pretty snazzy. Thank you. I don't know that I would use the word snazzy for it, but you are welcome. Uh, 61, okay. We're starting to score with her. Suddenly, a window opens over you and Valentine. Good day, comes a smooth voice. It is Inspector Ambrose, and he is holding a glass tumbler. Valentine tenses up, and she looks at you with an expression of absolute panic. Hello, Inspector. I didn't realize you were in the house. No, no you didn't, he says, chewing on the words with relish. Few do. He holds the glass tumbler up for you to see. 
I have a glass in my hand. So I see. Funny thing about a glass, one can hold it up to a wall or window and hear much of what is being said on the other side. I don't mean to say that I was doing that. I might simply have been first day and am enjoying a refreshing glass of water. He tries to steeple his hands, but cannot because of the glass tumbler. One moment, he disappears from the window and then returns without the tumbler. Then he steeples his hands. We're just having a conversation, Valentine says. Valentine has stood back to her accent, and now that you know the truth of it, it feels like watching a magician do a magic trick, but knowing the trick of it. Valentine really is a very good performer. And yet, one of you is missing. I thought I heard another voice when I opened the window, Inspector Ambrose says. Numbers don't lie. One Calvin, two Valentine, three, Mr. Person who disappears without a trace when I look out of the window. What do you say to that, Calvin? That's not true, Valentine says. I see that you have been crying. It's allergies, Valentine sniffs. Tell me precisely what is going on out here, if you please, Inspector Ambrose says. I inform Inspector Ambrose that Valentine is an imposter and should be arrested. Or, come on Valentine, what's the part? <laughs> or, I tell Inspector Ambrose that I don't know what he's talking about. Or, I lie and tell Inspector Ambrose that someone suspicious walked by not long ago. Come on Valentine, let us depart. This is gonna make him mad. We have him here, right? No, we don't. Okay, so he's... we don't have to care about him. Come on Valentine, let us depart. You and Valentine start to walk away. This is fascinating, Calvin, says Ambrose. I can't help noticing that you have forgotten one very important thing. What is that? That I know all already. You see, my friend, your departing in such a haste has proved to be the final piece of the puzzle. I said to myself, what would confirm my suspicions regarding you both? What would they have to do in order for me to be 100% certain that they are guilty? And I said to myself, they would have to try to leave when I addressed them. See, here. He opens his clues notebook and shows you the page where he wrote in bold hand. If they walk away, they are guilty. So, you see that I am no rank amateur. I know all. <laughs> I know what you have done. He looks at you meaningfully. Go on then. Walk away. But I know. But know this. Your secrets are no longer safe. I will reveal what I know at a perfect moment. And then you will look at me and whisper, Magnificent even as I click the handcuffs around your wrist. He's still talking when you turn the corner. He knows, Valentine says. We don't know what he heard. Just act naturally. I know you can do it. Right, thank you, thank you, she replies. You didn't tell me, you didn't tell on me. No, I didn't. Valentine makes a move to give you a hug. I hug back, I step away, I put out my hand for a handshake. Now we're gonna hug her back. Having an ally like this is going to be, in my opinion, crucial down the line, so let's hug her back. You're a real friend. We make friends fast in theatrical life. I hope that's okay. It is, you say. I don't like that inspector, Valentine says. He's been pestering me. It's getting late, you say. Is there anything else that you need to do before the hunting party returns? Probably. Are you sticking around? Sure, I'll stay with you, or bid farewell and head to the house to search rooms while the hunting party is still away, if we've done that already, and head to the wood to join the end of the hunt. Traveling takes 30 minutes. Sure, I'll stay with you. Let's help her. Good. You and Valentine stroll over to the table, set for the post-hunt nibble. Valentine considers the gramophone skeptically. We've got to put some music on, she says, before Mrs. Patterson and the others arrive. Gosh, their records are awfully boring. What's wrong with them, you ask? I like jazz, she returns. I'm mad about dancing. I love to dress up and dance. I even play the licorice stick, but... Licorice stick? I even play the licorice stick. That... I don't know what that means. Is that some kind of um, nickname for some instrument? <laughs> but just a bit, and I don't have it here. Do you like jazz? Count Bassie, Duke Ellington, say Calvin, do you dance the windy hop? Of course I dance the windy hop. If I were not on duty, I would. I need to be sure all is perfect here before the hunters return. Or I do not I do not do any sort of hop, windy or otherwise. Why don't we try dancing to something more elegant, like waltz? Uh, I think we're gonna tell her that if I were not on duty, I would. Oh, you don't have to be like that, Calvin. We're just having a little fun before we have to work. Come on, come on. One dance won't kill you. Just watch me. 
do what I do. Now is my turn to teach you. Okay, so that was a neutral option. Valentine cranks up the gramophone and drops a record on it. Sing, sing, sing by Benny Goodman begins to play, and the shrills, uh, the shrill annoying clarinet and the boom of the drum emerges. Frightful. You watch for a moment as Valentine begins to dance wildly, waving her arms around and lifting her knees and legs up alternately. Some of the other servants join in, laughing at Valentine's high spirits. You do a bit of last-minute refining of the party, straightening a chair and brushing away a few errant pebbles from the ground as the dance kicks into high gear behind you. It is then that you hear the sound of people approaching. It is the hunting party returning. Mrs. Patterson and the rest of the hunt are coming, you call, but the music is too loud and Valentine and the others can't hear you. How do you save the situation? Desperate times require desperate measures. I roll under the table and dive over the chairs to turn the gramophone off in time. I stand in attention and greet Mrs. Patterson, telling her that I've decided to create contemporary dance-themed celebration for her. I hide. Well, that's fun. I don't think Mrs. Patterson would like, like this, especially because it was mentioned that she hates showgirls. So desperate times require desperate measures. I roll over under the table and dive over the chairs to turn the gramophone off in time. You do a shoulder roll under the table and in a desperate bit to stop the music before the hunting party arrives. Regretful, your foot... No! Your foot gets caught on the tablecloth as you dive. There are well-known examples of master magicians entertaining large crowds by setting a full table with crystals and china and then whisking away the tablecloth in one swift motion leaving the table in perfect order. What you do with your foot is not quite like that magic trick. Not at all. Man, I hate that this is... I don't like this on this game. That happened several times already. That, um, you know, it gives you an option telling you what's going to happen and then it throws it in your face. Like, if it says, I try to do it, then I would consider it differently. I would, you know, I'll... But I didn't know there was a risk that we are going to fail. What you do with your food is not quite like that magic trick, not at all. With a crash and the telltale splatter of petit force on the ground and the crashing of glass in China, every single thing on the table plummets to the ground. While the other servants are stunned silent, Valentine is overcome with the giggles. It is upon this scene that on Primrose and the rest of the hunting party come up uh, upon you, tangled as you are in the tablecloth. Did this at least give us... No, it didn't give us nothing. 20 minutes later. The party is a complete wreck, and everyone stands around the mess, trying to muster up some enthusiasm. I say, does anyone know any good jokes? Rory says. Here's one. So this one fellow says to a second fellow, we'll call the second fellow Arthur, and the first fellow James. He says, are you the house painter? And, this is really a corking one, and Arthur says, yes I am. Hang on, I think I told it backwards. The first fellow should be Arthur. <laughs> As I was saying, interrupts on Primrose, I'm having some backup hot toddies and hot cocoa made so that we can recover some semblance of festivity. She tsks a good deal. You feel a tap on your shoulder. It is Regina Wilhelmina and she is holding a clipboard. How do you do, Dandelion? She whispers. She leads you by the elbow to a more secluded location at the side of the house. What do you have to report, Dandelion? Quickly, give me a brief outline. Yeah, she's starting to really hate us. Yeah, our Primrose is starting to really hate us. So, tell her about the suspicious mask I found in Hayes' room. I described this... I hope we can tell her everything. So, let's start about the suspicious mask I found in Hayes' room. That one is really suspicious. Masks are very suspicious. That's good work, Dandelion. What else did you find? I described the strange map of on Primrose Estates and the neighboring houses that I found in Hayes' room. A telling piece of evidence, obviously man meant to plan a heist, Regina muses. Not bad. What else? I told her that I discovered that on Primrose has some sort of secret in her past and that she, uh, that the house may be in jeopardy. Hmm, says Regina. Useful. Non-specific, but useful. Anything else? That's not all. There are rumors that Colonel Firesnuff is aware of Mrs. Patterson's secret. Horrifying, Regina says. I suspected that man is up to no good, and now we have some confirmation. What else did you find? I mentioned the black mask I found in Mopsy's room. I don't like the sound of that. Nobody ever wore a mask who didn't mean evil. Probably belongs to her gentleman friend. 
What about at fancy dress balls? Are you trying to be funny? What else have you got? Uh, I told Regina about the notebook I found in Inspector Ambrose's room. I found a notebook in Inspector Ambrose's room. It seems like he suspects you of, well, of being a spy in a secret organization. I'm aware of his Inspector Ambrose's prying. Yes, what else? Uh... I say that I found a letter written to Valentine suggesting that she was engaging in risky behavior and might run the risk of being arrested. No, I think we're not gonna not gonna tell on Valentine. Those are all fruits of my labor. Outstanding, Dan the Lion. This is brilliant, especially for your first inner circle trial. I do believe the only potential recruit who ever got more points in their first trial was me. She puts a great deal of check marks on the form on her quick board and circles something. It is at this moment that the window opens above you and Inspector Ambrose, wearing a deerstalker hat, casually leans out. Well, hello there, Calvin, he says. You seem to spend a good deal of time underneath windows. I wonder why that is. The word skulking comes to mind. Inspector Ambrose, you say. Yes, it is I. That was a very interesting conversation you and Regina Wilhelmina just had. What was that name she called you? Dandelion, was it? He flips through his clues book. We have Dandelion, we have Calvin, and we have Rudolph. So many names, so many identities. Those last two are my first and last names, you <laughs> reply. Of course they are, he says with amusement. I don't doubt you. Can you clarify the meaning of the conversation that I just happened to overhear? We were having a highly appreciated uh, we were having a highly appropriate conversation regarding the proper thread count for linen tablecloths. Thank you very much, Inspector. All is as it should be. Or well, Regina and I were discussing what I did this afternoon. That's all. We were simply discussing the weather. She was discussing the initiation ritual of a secret society. <laughs> uh... I think we're going to go with the first one. We were having a highly appropriate conversation. No doubt you were, Ambrose says. Fred count is very important. It is, you say. I do not disagree. One must take care when one weaves fine cloth. Or when one weaves a lie. I do not say you lie. Or may I say that people lie. Is that all, Inspector, you ask? Oh, that's all. Farewell. He closes the window and then reopens it. Oh, just one more thing. I nearly forgot. A trifle, really. I just wanted to let you know that your crimes have not gone unnoticed. I beg your pardon, you ask? Inspector Ambrose gives you a beatific smile. I know what you did while the others were out of the house, but you cannot fool me. Remember, I know what you did while the others were out of the house, but you cannot fool me. Remember this moment, Calvin. Remember it well. And he closes the window again. <laughs> As you return to the celebration, you see Aunt Primrose sitting together with Rory, deep in conversation. You can see that Aunt Primrose is giving Rory a thorough talking to and mincing no words. Did we fail him? Then Rory and Frankincense excuse themselves from the party, heading for a quiet spot to talk in private by the fountain. Clearly they are about to come to a decision. As they go, they pass directly in front of you. As they pass, you... Reach out and make a minute adjustment to Rory's outfit. Stand respectful at, the at attention. Turn away from them. Hand Frankincense the diamond I found in her room. Yeah, let's hand her the diamond. But how, Frankincense says. There's no time for explanation. Rory and Frankincense have walked past to make their decision. I wonder what they'll decide, Mopsy says, standing behind you, holding what you would guess is her fourth hot toddy. Yes, you say. That will be me and Figs before long, Mopsy remarks, gesturing to Rory and Frankincense in the distance, and swashing some of her hot toddy on the ground without noticing. Indeed, tonight. You turn to Mopsy. Tonight? Oh yes, she says, because you'll be smuggling him into Ritornello. Oh, I like the ends of these chapters. They are so, so, you know, always on a high point. Anyway, this was fun. Uh, I wonder what this uh, chapter tells us. We've learned a lot. We learned that Valentine... But, well, we learned everything about Valentine, I think. Unless there's a third lie in there somewhere. And she's not only lying about her identity and how she got into there, but she might be also lying about her new identity or her 
or what we you know think is a true identity at this point. Uh, we weren't of the issue with on primrose. Uh, we weren't of uh, mopsy. We weren't a bit about haze. I actually think we might have an issue there. Regina is starting to trust us. Um, I don't know. There are some just skills your reputation, renown, tranquility, suspicion. 64, invitation, 74. Tranquility, renown. I don't know what these uh, stats mean, and I haven't been tracking them. I think that suspicion might be uh, once it max out, we get arrested or something. Invitation is probably how well we are received there. Renown. <laughs> Tranquility. Yeah, we're probably disrupting everything. Uh, so best relations, Valentine and Mopsy. Then Frankincense. Okay, that's good. And Regina. Rory dropped significantly. He was above 50, and I guess because you let him down. And brief robust discussion. Oh, actually, we can see it here. Um, so... Renown is a measure of your astonishing performance as a servant. Okay, we got 40. Doing something striking, glorious, or simply intriguing will raise renown. Doing things that make you look foolish will lower renown. A servant with high renown will eventually find that they have doors open for them that otherwise would remain firmly closed. Tranquility is a measure of our ability to make things easier for people. Did we have like 28? <laughs> Invitation is the measure of your standing with the inner circle. Ah, okay. And suspicion is the measure... Uh, of to what extent you are seen as potential criminal by those in authority. A high suspicion may have unfortunate effect on your future employment. Oh, that is not good. Uh, expect to see... Okay, and about these ones. Expect to see quality is rated be between 25 and 75 for most of the game. Lower than 40 is subpar. A 40 is above the norm. 60 is notably good. 75 is breathtaking and worthy of approbation. Uh, okay, yeah, we have nothing subpar. Most of it is just below above average, and some of them, like intellect and observe, are very high. Cool. Okay, well, anyway, thank you very much for joining me. This was fun, and we're going to continue with another chapter tomorrow. So till then, you guys, take care.